Now I'm delighted to welcome our next speaker, Sinead Burke, to speak to us about the imperative of our industry to design for disability. Sinead challenges society's definition of accessibility and the economic value of designing for all. Please welcome Sinead Burke. They're, they're going to advance your slides for you. Okay. Oh, thank you. I'm an elementary or a primary school teacher, and I was teaching four and five year olds. It was my first day. I was nervous. A girl who looked sweet and innocent put up her hand to ask a question. I said, yes. She said, I have those shoes. <laughs> I was horrified. And I rang my mother immediately and said, you need to bring a new pair of shoes to the school right now. One of the children has the exact same. <laughs> Why was I upset? I've spent my whole life trying to convince the world that I am intelligent, articulate, professional, and an adult. And yet, the fashion industry, unintentionally or not, does the absolute opposite and inverse by what it offers me. My friends who are non-disabled and not a little person say, oh, but it's great. You can get Velcro shoes and light up runners. <laughs> and they're tax-free. OK, I'll take that one. But my money and my existence is as valid as yours. And yet I'm not accommodated for it. I have had an insatiable interest in the fashion industry for as long as I can remember, despite having such limited access to it. But for a second, I want you to think. Visualize yourself in your favorite retail store. Can you feel yourself meandering through the rails, finding something to pick and buy? Well, this is my experience. As you can see, I'm not smiling. That's unusual for me. I walk into a store and I see something that catches my eye. I walk over to it. I can't reach. I can't find my size. I have to approach a stranger and say, hi, my name is Sinead. I'm really sorry. I really love this, you know, orange mohair jumper. Do not judge. <laughs> Can you please pass it down to me in a size six? The stranger is kind as most are and they give it to me. What's the next step? I go to the changing rooms. Wonderful. If it's a closed door procedure, there's a lock. And usually I can't reach it. And if it's a curtain, I'm not strong enough to pull it across. So usually there is this slither of a gap that makes me an exhibitionist, even though my mother would be appalled. So I try it on, even though I'm uncomfortable in my surroundings. And the next step is I go to the till and the cash register. But the store is designed so that they can't see me. And understandably, those who work in retail are very frantic and have a lot to do and are shouting, next, please, next, please. All the while, I am embarrassed, mortified, standing right below them, hoping that another stranger goes, <coughs> <coughs> All I want to do is spend my money and look incredible. Now, thankfully, with the evolution of technology, that has offered a platform for accessibility. I can buy things wonderfully online, and they arrive via the postman. It's not glamorous, but we do what we got to do. But actually, unintentionally, what it has done is make those who are already vulnerable in society further reclusive, because we are saying, you are not welcome here. We haven't thought of you. We will take your money, but you don't get past the door. And that's not good enough. But my interest in fashion started much earlier on. It came about with conversations that I had with my family. I want to introduce you to them in a couple of minutes. But you look at me today, and you see that I'm a little person. And within my family unit, this is my dad standing beside me, my mother, and all of my siblings. I'm the eldest of five. 
My three sisters and my brother are all average height. They do not know that they are on screen today at BOF Voices, and apparently they're watching the live stream. Hi. <laughs> You're welcome. And as the eldest sibling of five, and as the eldest daughter, I would go shopping with my sisters, and they would pick up pairs of high shoes, and I would say, put them down, they don't fit you. And they would say, no, Sinead, they don't fit you. So my way in, as with everything, was through education. I would sit and devour information about how the industry, as a, as a society, as a system, worked. And I would spend every evening telling my parents about it. I would say, did you know who's up a profit and who's up a loss? Did you know that they're using technology in mirrors and dressing rooms now to get you the right size? You don't even have to interact with a human. And they would say, that's wonderful, Sinead, but it's not really for us. And that's understandable, because they didn't have the challenge and still don't that I do. But for me, fashion is more than a trend. It's more than something that one does and wears cerulean and it starts in Dior and it goes down to the high street. Thank you, Meryl Streep. Fashion touches our skin. It is one of the few industries that is tactile enough that bears on every single person. And for me, it's empowering. You look at me and you see that I have a chondroplasia. It is a genetic condition with a mutation of the FGF4-3 gene. But today, that's not what you see. I am dressed for battle, ladies and gentlemen. I am wearing... I am wearing Burberry head to toe. And when I was 15 years old, I maintained my interest in fashion despite not being allowed in. Nine years later, I'm here. But as regards to that, when I was growing up, I was looking for fashion that was designed for disabled people. It was always designed by non-disabled individuals and always through a medical or sympathetic lens. They were constantly concerned about my needs. My needs are fine. And my doctor looks after those. What do I want fashion for? To feel confident, to feel beautiful, to feel sensational and to feel incredible. And the industry as a whole is nervous about how to embrace that. And how does it work? How do we meet form with function? Well, Ladies and gentlemen, when I announced on the internet that I was going to be speaking at Voices, Burberry got in touch and said, would you like to wear Burberry at Voices? I replied very professionally, yes, of course, whilst at home going. <laughs> and they said, you'll need to come to town a little bit early. I said, I can do that. And I spent Monday afternoon in the Regent Street store going through the entire women's wear and children's wear department, both sections which I teeter between to seeing what would fit. And it was an education for both the brand and myself. So this is a women's wear jacket, completely custom. It's part of the collection. What they did was alter the sleeves, put a dart in the back. I now have a trench coat, an item of clothing that I have wanted since I was 12, but couldn't find. Why? I'm size 9 to 10 in children's wear. I put it on, but it couldn't close because I have a bust. I am the size of a child, but I am not a child. I try on the women's wear and it is too big, and I have a wonderful seamstress who has been part of my life since I was four. Would I give her a Burberry trench to adapt and alter custom? I'm sorry, Nora, no. <laughs> but they did it, and one thing that they learned is that part of a chondroplasia is that I have a curvature in my spine, exhibit A. It gives me the same size waist as Kate Moss and the same size hips as Nicki Minaj. <laughs> So what do you do with a garment like a trench coat? I gave them the exact tools that they needed. You make it longer, an inch and a half at the back. Why? Because it allows for the bump that is needed to cover my derriere. And when on me, it sits perfectly equal and round as a circumference. On a hanger, it looks odd. So what is the point of disability in fashion? I would love to encourage you all to do it, to reach for your better instinct and the moral good. That's not how business works. How many disabled people are there in the world? Do you know? Globally, it's about 1.2 billion. How much money, discretionary income, do they have to spend? One trillion US dollars. And then you include their family members and their friends? That's 6.9 trillion US dollars. 
You want a reason, ladies and gentlemen, to embrace the disabled community and to look for a market which you can explore and be creative? There it is. But how do you do it? Because unfortunately, you've been doing it quite wrong over the past few years. Because you think you know what disabled people need or want instead of asking us. What I wish for you to do is to make yourself slightly vulnerable and learn from theorists such as Foucault when they talk about power sharing. Bring us to the table. Ask us for our greatest insights, because we live this experience every single day. And not only will it alter how we buy and wear your clothes, it offers employment opportunities that will bring about expectations that you could barely even realize at the moment. But it will also impact upon how you design your children's wear, your women's wear, your accessories, and every element of your business. Why should you do it? It's 2017, it's goddamn time. Thank you very much. Sinead, first of all, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, at BOF, we talk about left brain and right brain a lot. And so you had like all of the emotion and passion and creativity, and you had the data to support your argument. So I very much appreciate that. No, thank you. Um, I had one question for you, which is like, if you're an executive in this room and you're thinking about this and you've been kind of, your eyes have been opened by this talk, like what's... What can brands and designers do towards making a really long-term shift in a meaningful way that's going to last? I think there are a number of ways in which change can be incurred. So first of all, those who are studying design and design colleges need to be exposed to different types of bodies. So why is there not a challenge within the academic curriculum to design for anything outside of the standard sizing and having to fit those different silhouettes? I also think there's a responsibility in terms of employment that you need to be particular about the people that you are bringing to your brand because those disabled and othered voices have a whole different lens through which they view the world and that has value to your brand. It is also about the people that you choose to represent and be the voice for your brand. Thankfully, we are living in an industry where role models and those whom we dress on the red carpet and those who are the face of our brands is changing slightly in its diversity, but there is no reason why disabled individuals can also be those voices, and I would ask you to do so. I think it's also a responsibility on brands to offer bursaries and different initiatives to bring about those skills and those talents, to introduce them to an industry that has been inaccessible for so long, and if you work in the media, I think you have an incredible opportunity to amplify disabled and diverse voices without the lens of sensationalism. I was once interviewed, and the first question I asked was, when did you realize you weren't normal? <laughs> I said, what does that mean? And they said, oh, I said, exactly. And I think there's so much that we all can do, either as an ally or as somebody with an enormous amount of power and privilege, and it is your responsibility to meet the call to action and to do something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinead. <laughs>